Watching that last TED talk, it made me think of two things. Um, one, that Maybach could have bought a really nice telescope. Uh, and two, uh, just like in some hip hop, the power comes from down below. So does mine. I've got a uh, big car battery down here. Um, all right, so my talk today is on uh, astrophotography. And well, what is it? So, well, let's break it down astro, stars, right? Photo, light. So it's light from stars, then gravity, right? So we're just uh, taking the light from distant objects and putting it on, used to be film, but now everything's digital, it makes things a lot easier. So why do I do it? Uh, first of all, uh, if you've ever been uh, under the night sky in an area where it's not very light polluted and look up, it's just amazing. Even more so if you've ever looked through a telescope at the moon and the craters of the moon and things like that. The other thing too is it's challenging. You know, every night I set up, uh, this it takes you know, about a half an hour or so to kind of get it wheeled out of the garage and have the aim just perfectly. Everything's set up right, and then sometimes the, I got to turn the computer on and it's installing updates, and there goes the whole thing. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's uh, a very Sisyphusian, you know, pushing a boulder up the hill. Yeah, sometimes, but it's also rewarding. So some nights, uh, you know, let it run overnight, and we'll talk about the process in a little bit. And then uh, some nights I get really bad data. Some nights just everything clicks, and those nights that it clicks, it what keeps me coming back. So, some wonderment. So the light left the things I'm taking pictures of a really long time ago uh, for a lot of things. For the moon, uh, it's about two, three seconds. So I'm looking at the moon as it was a couple of seconds ago. But for some of the other objects, that light's been traveling for uh, tens of millions of years. So that light left where it came from well before humans were put on Earth. Um, and uh, it's just, I'm there to collect that light and kind of uh, make a record, archive it. Um, and then also it really kind of puts you, it, it can make you either feel really big and really special or really small and insignificant because the uh, universe is a mess. It's all that we know. Um, we can't see the edges of it. It's, we'll never get to the edges of it. We'll probably never leave our solar system. But uh, you know, it also gives us a sense that as far as we know, this is the only place that life exists. So it gives us a really sense of uh, being special. And I like feeling special. I don't <laughs> and then um, it's uh, it's short lived. Like humans have only been on the scene, as I said, you know, before the light that I'm capturing left. Uh, you know, humans weren't around while that light was in transit. You know, we've evolved from what we evolved from and got there. So it was on its way, and you know, I happened to just uh, step in the way and preserve it. And then also a connection to the past. So uh, in ancient cultures. Uh, the night sky was a way to kind of mark time, look at um, when to plant, when to harvest certain celebrations, when to sacrifice things. Uh, some of our most enduring doc uh, uh, some of our most enduring monuments are astronomical. So Stonehenge, it's a line to, to show uh, the solstices. Uh, I think I've seen the pyramids are lined up in the same arrangement as the Orion's belt. Uh, so there's a lot of really kind of interesting connections to the past. Uh, and then also knowing that when you go up and look at the moon, that's the same moon that some of the greatest scientists and artists and poets have looked to for inspiration. Um, so it's a link to our past. So I think that's kind of interesting. So what are some of the challenges? Well, we're moving incredibly fast. Just if you think about it, in one day, if I told you in 12 hours you have to be in the middle of Russia, uh, you'd have to be moving pretty quick. You'd have to head on 76, head down to the airport, you try to find a plane, uh, get over to Russia, drive to the middle of Siberia. Or you just wait 12 hours and where we'll be is where Russia was 12 hours ago because the Earth is spinning. So anybody that's ever trying to take a picture of something that's moving fast knows that there's some challenges involved. The other challenge is the light that from some of these things is very, very faint. Uh, or else we wouldn't need these things to see them. Now obviously the moon and some of the stars are very bright. But a lot of the things that I like to take pictures of are, uh, are very dim. So for that, I need to take long exposures. And again, if you've ever tried to take a picture of something moving quickly, one of the ways to avoid that blur is to take a very short exposure. So how do I uh, account for that? How do I speed things up? Well, aperture, this is basically the opening. We'll go over all this in just a minute. But the opening here, this is where the light comes in. And the bigger that aperture, uh, the more light it can collect and the last time I need to take a picture. Uh, the other thing is 
the focal length. And this basically is, is the length that the light travels to focus. And that changes how, um, basically, their field of view. So for some things, if I wanted to take a look at a planet, I want to use a really long focal length. If I wanted to use something, uh, take a look at something really big, like the Andromeda Galaxy, which, if it were brighter, it would be way bigger than our full moon in the night sky. So that's kind of one of the myths with telescopes. Telescopes don't necessarily magnify things by a lot. They can, but that's not necessarily their main purpose. And then uh, the other thing is sensitivity. So and anybody deals with the photography, that's the ISO, the ISO. So the higher the ISO, you can have more sensitivity, but also it introduces some noise in the picture. So our equipment, you don't need this whole big fancy uh, setup here. You can just use, uh, you can take some incredibly <coughs> cool night pictures uh, with just a tripod and an ordinary camera. So here's an example of one. Uh, I think it was a little brighter on my computer there, but that's just a lighthouse, and you can see uh, this is a constellation of Cassiopeia in the background. Uh, this is the conjunction this summer of Jupiter and uh, Venus just after sunset. Uh, this is from my driveway, just taking a picture of this setup. Uh, I think this was New Year's Eve. Uh, ironic, there's, you can't really tell from here, but these are two Subarus, and Subaru in their symbol uses the, uh, the Pleiades, which is right there. So that was unintentional, but I can uh, say I meant to do that. And then, uh, you know, this is the Milky Way. This is uh, from the beach, a uh, really dark night. It took the, like about a 30 second exposure. This is just a lifeguard stand. And it was nearly pitch black. There's just a little bit of faint light from a distant house uh, was cast on here, but you can see the the path of the Milky Way there. And uh, I think last fall, uh, there was a field nearby that had a bunch of sunflowers that me and a friend went and uh, took pictures of the sunflowers. This is a method called star trails. So basically I set the camera up on a, tel on a tripod and took a bunch of pictures without moving the camera. And in each frame, the stars moved ever so slightly across the sky. And there's software, you can just stack those up to kind of produce that. Another more dramatic one, this is from my deck. Uh, in the back of my house. So this is, if you notice, this is the, the North Star. So if you could draw a line straight up from the North Pole, it would hit there. And so this star doesn't really move much when the Earth moves. But as you get closer to the equator, uh, you get a much greater uh, distance. When, uh, when I put this picture in here, I was trying to figure out how long it take to, to take this picture. Well, this star would make one entire circle in 24 hours. So 180 degrees of this would be 12 hours, and this looks like to be maybe a third or a quarter of that, so three or four hours for that. I think there was like two or three hundred pictures that we just stacked up there. All right, so if you want to graduate to something a little bigger, uh, we have this mount here. So this, this, uh, this is where all the action happens. This is the, uh, probably the most expensive part of this. And the job for this is to counteract the rotation of the Earth. So what I'll do is a little telescope in here, and I'll, I'll aim this axis right here to the north star, so I'll aim it up to the north. And then I'll slew, or move this, let's see, to the target that I want to image for the night. So I use a little laptop and give it commands. And it will move on its own to where, uh, if I set it up well, to where I want to image. So that's moving its way. Hopefully it doesn't hit itself sometimes, it's like God. Uh, the computer can be like a bully big brother. You quit hitting yourself, quit hitting yourself. Okay. So sometimes it crashes into that. Um, but once it's finally set up, uh, I've got some other things that I need to take into consideration. So if it's not perfectly set up, uh, and I'm taking long exposure, so I'm leaving the shutter open for about five minutes for some of these things, if it's not perfectly set up, I get some blur. So one of the ways to counteract that is there's like a little mini telescope on the piggyback. And this one will find a star, and there's a little camera hooked up to it, and I tell the computer, stay on that star. So as it's tracking through the night, with the tracking of it, and takes it off of that star just a little bit, this camera will send a correction to kind of keep it uh, on pace. And then the camera, uh, you can see from back there, this is very similar to the cameras that we're using uh, to document this. This is just a Canon DSLR that's been uh, specially modified. So a lot of the light that I collect is kind of really in the infrared section of the uh, spectrum. Most cameras are sensitive to that, but they put a filter in, or else your pictures would look a little bit redder than what we're used to. So I paid somebody and I rip it open, take that filter out and put it back together. I didn't risk damaging myself. 
and the software. We'll talk a little bit about the software, this little planetarium software here that tells me where things are in the sky. Then I've got software that tells this camera to do what it needs to do. Then I've got software that tells the guy scope what to do. So, now I collect the light. So for bright objects like the moon and the stars, some issues really come down to, this is a video I took through the telescope of, uh, I hope it's not the neighbor's video, um, uh, the moon, right? So hopefully this should load in just a second. Maybe that. Should be a link to YouTube. Okay. Well, the extra time at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll pull that back up because I've got the, the link to YouTube and put up there. Um, but basically, if you've ever been to the swimming pool and you've looked at the bottom and somebody left a coin at the bottom of the swimming pool, it's really tough to tell what that coin is from outside of the pool because the motion of the water kind of blurs it. Well, the atmosphere does the same thing. If you ever look through uh, binoculars at a boat out at sea or through a telescope, you'll see that the atmosphere is very, very wavy. So that pool water might be six or seven feet deep and it's very wavy. Our atmosphere is uh, about 60 miles thick, so there's a lot of turbulence up there. It somewhat blurs the image. So what we do is take video, and that video we uh, process it, and it'll find the sharpest frames and sharpest parts of that, so we can ultimately get a picture that's super sharp. So this is a crater from the moon. If you looked up at the full moon, this is about the center of it. You can be sensitive to scale. This is about 100 miles across. So, um, and that's with this telescope uh, kind of maxed out, as zoomed in as it possibly can. Uh, this is a little mini crater here that's about five miles. So, even with that resolution, still wouldn't be able to see any traces of us being there. So you wouldn't be able to see the rover or the flag or any of that stuff. So for dim objects, like galaxies and nebula, it's very faint. So things that we do is uh, special processing where we take long exposures. And those exposures right from the camera, we call those light frames. And they're, uh, they're kind of very noisy straight from the camera because they're long exposures and there's lots of error, uh, random your cosmic rays could expose it. So what we do is, uh, is take a lot of them. So on a given object, I might take 40 or 50 pictures of essentially the same thing. They're all slightly different. And then uh, this is one right from the camera. Kind of tough to see really any detail here. It's got a couple of stars. Uh, if you could see on a monitor, this is pretty grainy. It doesn't look that great. And then uh, what I do is take a bunch of dark frames, and these are just basically using the same settings I took for the, the light frames, except I put the cap on here. It's almost like being an amateur photographer taking a roll of film with your lens cap on. And what that does is find um, things that are inherently wrong with the shape. So this is like a 13 or 14 megapixel camera. Uh, that's millions of pixels. Every pixel is slightly different in terms of their sensitivity. So this uh, is a way to kind of account for that. So it'll boost up some of the dimmer ones and kind of cut down some of the brighter ones. And this is really not much to look at. It looks like this. If we were to zoom in, you'd see some like, lighter pixels and darker pixels, but those aren't very exciting. And then we have our flat frame. So anytime you're looking through one of these things, you're going through like a cardboard tube, it kind of dims the surrounding. We have what's called vignetting. There's also um, dust on my sensor. So it might be tough to see, but there's a little ring here, and that's from a dust piece of dust. The way I take that is I just stretch a white t-shirt over the front of this and take a bunch of pictures of the sky at, during the day. You'll also notice it's brighter in the center than it is on the side. So uh, this is a way to kind of account for some of the deficiencies of this. So then I load all of those in to some software that basically uh, puts all of the light frames together. Anything that looks like a signal in all of those frames, it says, yeah, that's really there. Some of the things that are signals in some frames that aren't, it drops those out. And what we end up with is a very smooth picture. So this picture here is just like the light frame, but it's, if you can see closer, it's very, uh, it's not grainy at all, but it's still not very bright. So um, anybody tell what that is? I mean, besides just a star? So there's a lot of hidden detail in there. So then I go into Photoshop. So I open that up in Photoshop. This picture right here is on the order of about 100 megabytes, which is like your, your cell phone to take maybe two or three megabyte pixels. So there's or megabyte uh, pictures. So there's a ton of information in here. In Photoshop, this is where the art comes in. 
and then in Photoshop, I align the colors. If you look at this, it's kind of got a purplish hue to it, which isn't really how the sky looks. So then I open it up, and I open up this thing called Levels. And this is a histogram. Anybody know what a histogram is for uh, just in general? So what we have uh, for each of the colors, red, green, and blue, uh, you have strength of our signal, meaning like no signal over here, and that pixel all the way loaded up with signal. And then every time there's a pixel that accounts for that much signal, we put a little dot in there. So most of the picture's signal, which is well, mostly this dark background, is right around here. Most of the interesting things in this picture are lying right around here. So what I'm going to do is basically make this little wedge of my picture a bigger part. So I stretch this using some tools. And uh, I, I, I make it brighter. I make the background darker. I increase the contrast. And ultimately, if everything works out well, I've done something good, I end up with a picture that looks like this. So that's that very same picture uh, after about an hour of processing Photoshop. Doing, undoing. Uh, this is a little dim. Is there a way to turn the lights off in here? Maybe it's a little. So, yeah, this is um, up there. It looks a little bit better. This is, anybody know what this is? Space, right? This is a nebula. Right? Stars, right? This is a horse head nebula, uh, which is in the belt of Orion. So, this is one of the stars in the belt of Orion. There's a lot of really hot gas in here that's glowing red, uh, incandescently like a, uh, a neon sign. And this is actually a big lump of dust that's slowly condensing into stars. So uh, it just so happens to look like the head of a horse. So, and uh, that's the end result. So, um, but yeah, that's all I got for you. It looks like you're probably coming up with about a minute. Or two. Question back there. Unrelated, but did you, um, did you go to the University of Wyoming? I did not, but I, I, uh, I saw like a sticker. Yeah, so I did a field geology course in Wyoming. So we were in a, I went to a, a minivan in Wyoming for 10 days. So, yeah, yeah. Yes? How do you like account for airplanes and stuff like that? Did those ever get so, yeah, that, that'll happen. Uh, but because I take enough of those light frames, the software says, well, I only see this part of the signal lit up in one frame. So it must not be important, so it'll actually remove that. But it is, sometimes it's, it's neat, but sometimes it can ruin an image, you know, back in the days of film, when they just, you know, had to hold it open for a long time. Uh, if a plane flew by, that's like 10 minutes of lost time, that they're just like, uh, but sometimes you can see the lights and the tail light will blip and you can tell what, you know, the airline is. Uh, I've had satellites go through my images, which is kind of neat, so. Cool. Any other questions? Yes? Um, books on the internet, yeah, so, and I'm still learning, right? there's still a lot, like, I like, you know, when I'm done with these pictures, a lot of times I'll, uh, I'll see how other people have done them, you know, I, I go from feeling, oh, this is such a great picture, and I see what other people do, and I'm like, oh, man, this is terrible, right? I, just try to, I try not to compare myself to others, like when I golf, right, I try to compare myself to myself, or else I'll just get very angry, so, yeah.